Uh, well, some are on Zoom too. Right. Some are on Zoom too. Oh. Okay. Yeah, well, wait till four o'clock. Yeah, yeah, so most people kind of throw in a bit. Are you past picture blurs? Yeah, we're kind of in between. Our next one is I, I plan for the next set to be right before Thanksgiving. So I'll have that in the break. Oh, good. And then yeah. they don't have to worry about the next day. That's true. Oh, that's nice. But they're all probably super nervous. Oh. Yeah. Oh, I posted as soon as I created. I try to get in done oh, before before things, the actual things. Oh, so. And then I don't worry about it Thanksgiving. Yeah. yeah. Thanksgiving's always so late in the semester, though. Same time. Break. Yeah. 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 It works well with the Zoom. Uh, okay, it's four o'clock. Let's go and get started. All right, good afternoon, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Good. Thanks for asking. All right. So today we actually we have a special guest, and so uh, so we have Nathan here. He's gonna um, take up the first couple minutes of lecture. He's gonna give an announcement, and then we'll get started for that. So, all right. Nathan, go ahead. Hi, everybody. My name is Nathan. I work in the ECS Graduate International Admissions Office here uh, in ECS. So I handle pretty much mainly the application process for grad school. So has anyone ever thought of grad school? Yeah, yeah, we've got a few. Okay. So if you have an interest, we do have a grad info session um, that's going to be happening on November 9th from 12 to 1 p.m. So if you're interested, you want free food, uh, we're going to have some pizza there. Uh, first 20 minutes, we're going to go over like the, the process, the requirements, and then how easy it is for Cal State Fullerton students to apply and then have their um, application expedited to the next process. So we're gonna do that for the next, the first 20 minutes. And then the last uh, 20 to 30 minutes, you're gonna meet with either the graduate program advisor or the um, uh, department chair. And they're gonna go over the logistics on in terms of like what you're gonna be, how many classes you need to take. Some, some departments, it's like nine or 10 extra classes and you get your master's degree, right? So um, they're gonna be going over all of that. And then, yeah, that's about it. We're gonna do food over there. So we're gonna have pizza, snacks, drinks, and then we're also going to um, do some giveaways too. So it'll be a little, it'll be interactive. So it's not like you're just listening to a PowerPoint or anything. So um, if you are interested, keep your hand up. I'm gonna pass around a QR code. This is like the RSVP. And um, I saved your spot there. And then uh, if you don't, you know, uh, don't have it or anything, I can, I can send the flyer to Dr. And, I'm just writing down the uh, the info. This was something else too. Professor. Yeah, what's up? Does this just apply to um, uh, going to grad school at Fullerton or could this apply to applying elsewhere? So this only pertains to Cal State Fullerton, um, but if you do want other, like if you would have to look at the other uh, universities to see what their requirements are, their processes, um, it could be fairly the same or similar, but uh, for this grad info session, we're just gonna focus on Cal State Fullerton. And they have a question in the chat too. Sure. You can't make it to the info session. Will there be a summary of the event to look over for those that are interested? Yeah, if you want, um, I am also located in Computer Science 311. 
So if you want to take note of that, come by, stop by the office, uh, and uh, I could always give you the rundown on what's going to be covered there if you want to just have a one-on-one -on -one as well. All right, Louis? And was there, was there a location? I didn't see one on the flyer. Oh, location. Um, it's going to be a CS300. CS300. Okay. CS300, yeah. So it's on the same floor. Um, yeah. And then this is obviously for mainly for juniors and seniors. That's why uh, on, on the flyer that we kind of post out, it's not going to state the, the area. But since this is a junior senior class, it is going to be in room CS300, November 9th from 12 to 1 p.m. Awesome. Thank yes. You. At CSUF. So um, all of our ECS graduate programs. So um, right now you're mechanical, right? So if you're looking into mechanical or if you're even looking to a different program, uh, we're going to be pretty much covering that. And that's why we have this RSVP is so that we can show all the department chairs and graduate program um, coordinators uh, who's interested and how many students are going to attend there their uh, breakout session. So yeah, you're welcome. All right, if there's no other questions, you know where to find me. We took my um, uh, office down and just wanted to thank Dr. Tran again for letting me present this info session. So but yeah, Lewis, hopefully uh, I see you in my office and then we can talk uh, more on the logistics side. So all right, thank you uh, very much. Have a good rest of your day. Good luck on your midterms. All right, see you. Awesome. Yeah, thanks, Nathan. Yeah, so the, yeah, so grad school is it's, it's a is a great option, you know. Especially you know nowadays, I think everyone's looking for a way to kind of have their applications to the employers. So grad school is a great way to do that. Um, and there's there's a lot of practical reasons to get your grad school done at the same place as your undergrad. So a lot of a lot of schools they call it kind of a four plus one. I don't I don't think they use that exact terminology here, but that's basically saying that you know you're already in our system here. You probably already um, satisfied some of the requirements. And so you can probably knock out grad school in just one extra year. And so, you know, practically speaking, to get a master's degree one extra year, you know, that stands out a lot to employers. So it's a good, it's a good cost uh, benefit versus the cost is a good, it's a good exchange. And so I know I have a lot of friends that did that. Um, I mean, I mean, for myself, I, I finished an entire PhD, but I did. I had a lot of friends that did just go back for one extra year. They got a master's degree. And then you know they're they're in really great positions now in their career because you know they're able to, they're able to get a good first job, and then from there they're able to transition to a lot of other places there. So it's a great option. You know, of course you can talk to Nathan about it, but you know if you kind of want to get my perspective too, I'm always happy to talk about it too. So if you want to come by office hours or send me an email, just ask about it. That's that's you know I'd be more than happy to talk about that. Okay, okay. all right. And so um, thank you guys for uh, um, you know for um, listening to that. Okay. And so um, now we're going to get back to kind of what we talked, what we were talking about last Thursday. And so last Thursday, um, you know, if you had, if you weren't here last Thursday and you haven't had a chance to watch the lecture recording last Thursday, I, I would definitely recommend that you do so. Uh, at the very least, the, the first half, because uh, the first half of the class I spent talking about the final project. And so uh, I know there's there's been a lot of chatter on the Discord server too. People are forming groups, which is great. Uh, I've already gotten a couple emails from a couple of groups that have already that already know what topic they want to cover for the final project. And so, um, you know, I'm I'm not I'm not that worried about topics in this class because there's there's a lot of potential topics, and so I don't think there's going to be much overlap. But you know, if you if you do have a group together already and you know what topic that you're going to that you want to do, uh, go ahead and send me an email with everyone in the group, and then you know I can go ahead and just kind of make sure that that topic is 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 good because I've had a couple of groups already email me asking for a topic that's a little bit outside the scope of what, what was covered, but I think they're great topics and I think, you know, they make for good projects. And so um, if you have something like that already, or you already have a group together, then, you know, uh, please don't hesitate. Just let me know. And, uh, you know, I can go ahead and, and make sure that that's all, all good. Okay. And so uh, where we left off last Thursday was we were uh, finishing talking about muscle dynamics. And so we have a little bit more to cover on that. Um, just kind of just one extra page of notes. And then after that, we'll go ahead and move on to the next section. Uh, and the next section I think is one of the coolest in the class, um, which is about kinematics and motion capture. So, uh, but we'll get, we'll get into that more a bit um, later, but um, yeah. But then, yeah, we had the announcement about the grad info session. And I guess, you know, before, before I jump back into where we were last week, are there uh, any questions I can answer uh, in general about the class? Okay. Homework, homework four is out there. So I think homework four, 
is due this Thursday. And so make sure, make sure you guys are working on that. And if you have questions on it, uh, you know, definitely shoot me an email and uh, I'd be happy to help you. Okay. okay. We, we still have a bit to go until the, the next midterm. So I, I don't want to talk about it just yet. The, the midterm exam is planned for the Thursday right before we leave for Thanksgiving. And so I want to, I want to sign it then just so that you guys don't have to worry about over Thanksgiving. I have kind of that break to grade it. And so, you know, we still have a few more weeks until then. So we'll talk about the midterm once we get closer. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and pick up where we left off last Thursday. Uh, and in particular, we were talking about uh, muscle moment arm dynamics. So muscle moment arm, as if you remember, is a um, you know it's a concept that we're very familiar with through our, our, our discussion on statics, and it's basically the distance in between um, where the muscle attaches to the joint on which it acts to. Okay. And so in our static analysis, you know, we were describing it, or the symbol that we used for it was LM, okay? So it was the distance between the muscle and the joint, okay? And its primary purpose, or at least in terms of our calculation, is that it determined how much torque um, the muscle can, uh, can output around the joint. And so as an example, you know, we, let's say we have our favorite muscle, the bicep, okay? So here is the arm, here is the muscle. Okay. This distance right here is LM, okay? And so if we have the muscle force and we have it pointed upwards like that, okay? So we have FM pointing up, then LM is gonna determine how much torque that the uh, muscle can output. Okay? So the torque here, is equal to just the product of FM times LM. And there might be some trick stuff. And so you might have to do a sine of a theta M or a cosine theta M, um, you know, depending on whichever component is perpendicular to that. Okay? But generally speaking, this is, this, is the, this is the relationship that we have, which is the torque is a product between a muscle force or a component of the muscle force multiplied by the moment arm. All right, and so generally speaking, the higher the moment arm or the, the larger the distance in between the muscle and the joint, the more torque that the muscle can output. And so if you saw that, you know, you would maybe think that gen, it, it would be beneficial to have larger moment arms in your body, but we've already discussed about why that's just not practically feasible for, you know, for a number of different reasons. And we'll go over that again today as well, okay? But, you know, this, this whole discussion of moment arms and, and everything that we talked about in statics kind of avoids a, a very key question, which is, you know, how do we actually measure? These? How do we even know, you know, what these moment arms are? Okay. 
Because in, in concept, it's simple. It's, it's where it's just wherever the muscle attaches and you just take a ruler and you measure the distance between that and the joint. Okay? Uh, but that's a lot easier said than done because your, your muscles are not exactly you know, point forces. And so if you go in, and so if you look at your arm right now, right? And so if I ask you, you know, go ahead and measure the, the moment arm between your bicep and your elbow, um, that's, not the, that's not the easiest thing to do. Um, because you know your muscles are hidden underneath your skin, and even underneath your skin, you have kind of a bundle of muscles, and different muscles kind of cross over other muscles, and, and so on. It gets it gets pretty complicated. Um, and so, of course, you know what we use instead, um, and kind of the assumption that we've been using so far is that we we've, we've taken measurements from uh, cadavers, or maybe measurements from you know an average of people. And so, you know, that's one that's one thing that we can do is we can you know cut up some dead people and measure what the distances are. Um, but there's but there's a more clever way that we can um, that we can measure this um, on a patient by patient basis that doesn't require cutting someone up. Okay? And this and this way of measuring the moment arm is known as the tendon excursion definition of the moment. Arm. And so even though it's hard to kind of measure individual muscles, um, you know, externally, because it's, it's underneath your skin, generally speaking, it's, it's not that difficult to measure the size of an entire, what we call muscle tendon assembly, okay? Because uh, your muscles, they attach to your tendons and then your tendons attach to your bones. And so uh, for a lot of muscles in your body, you can actually measure that entire length because you can kind of visually see it from the outside. And what's interesting about this is that as, as your body goes through motion, and so as you, as you kind of move your limbs and such and that, right, in order to create that movement, your muscle has to shorten. Okay? And so what you can do is you can actually measure, you know, the size of the muscle tendon assembly, you know, as, as your body kind of goes through motion. And so as the muscle kind of contracts and as it kind of uh, shortens in length, then the entire muscle tendon assembly is going to change in size as well. And we can measure that from the outside. Okay. Another thing that we can measure, and, and we'll go over this more in a bit, and that's kind of why I'm using this as a transition topic, is you can measure the body angles that the, that the, that the limbs make with each other as well. So as you, you know, as you flex your elbow, you can measure, you know, the angle between your upper arm and your lower arm as you go through that motion. And at the same time, as you're doing that, you can measure, you know, the length of your biceps 
muscle and tendon assembly from, from the outside. Okay. It turns out that both of these quantities here are actually connected and they can actually be used to measure the moment on. And so the moment arm, and so I'm gonna go ahead and use the same symbol that I've used before. So I'll call it LM, okay? M in the denominator. This is equal to the derivative of LMT. So LMT here is the length of the entire muscle tendon assembly. And you're gonna take the derivative with respect to um, the joint angle or, or theta. Okay. And this LM here, this is the moment term. It's out MT, so muscle, um, MT for muscle tendon. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so what this is saying is, is that the rate of change of the muscle tendon length, and so the total length of your muscle and tendon together, the rate of change of that as your body goes through different joint angles, that has to be equal to the moment arm. And so, what is this, and so what is this equation telling us? And so this is telling us that in order for muscles with a short moment arm, that means that this rate of change is not very high. Let me bring back the, the drawbridge analogy, okay? And so if you remember from before, we had this analogy where we had a drawbridge, okay? And we wanted to pull up this, this drawbridge, right? And so, you know, let's, let's look at the case for a small moment arm first. And so for a small moment arm, you know, it would be a case where if the drawbridge string was attached very close to the end, or if this was kind of the hinge right here, okay? Right, and so let's say that this is going to a, wheel right here, and there's a rope, and we have a bunch of people pulling on this rope. Okay. And so in order to draw, pull the drawbridge up, you know, this rope has to be pulled to the left, right? So people have to kind of pull it like that. Okay. And so in this situation, you know, because the moment arm is so small, okay, so we call this is LM, okay? The moment arm is so small, and so you know what the, these people are going to have to output a lot of force in order to raise up this entire drawbridge, but they don't have to actually walk that far. And so the you know maybe these people only have to move a certain amount of distance. Okay, we'll call this delta L M T. Okay, and so if they only walk back, you know, let's say five steps, then that's going to be enough to pull the drawbridge all the way up. And that's a result of the moment arm being really, really small. But if we look at the opposite situation,
Okay? For muscles with long moment arms, in order to produce any kind of motion, the muscle itself has to contract a lot. And so it has to basically cover a lot more distance. Okay? And so let me go ahead and draw the drawbridge again. It's hinged here on the left, but now we have this string. Let me draw it a bit better. Okay. So now the string is attached to the end of the bridge, where now the moment arm is much higher here. Okay. So you draw our people again. And so in order to draw the drawbridge up, you know, maybe they have to output less force because uh, you know, the, the moment arm is much higher. But in order to fully close the bridge, you know, these guys have to walk much, much farther. And so this idea of you know, how much the muscle has to contract versus the body angle, that is kind of a, a really nice, elegant way to measure the, uh, the moment arm, okay? And of course, you know, if, if you have a larger moment arm, as you can see kind of in this analogy here, if you wanted to produce the same motion, okay, the muscle has to also has to contract a lot faster too, right? Um, just because there's just a lot more distance to cover. And so, um, you know, for these reasons, it's it's not that common for you to see muscles with a large moment arm. There are um, there are some, and so kind of mostly in your in your in your in your back. But generally speaking, most of the muscles in your body have a small moment arm to kind of minimize the amount of distance that it has to cover. Okay. And this and this helps kind of with the efficiency of the muscle as well, because if you remember from last Thursday, you know, we talked about there's there's kind of a sweet spot in terms of muscle length in terms of where muscles can operate the, 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 with the most efficiency. And so with the small moment arm, you know, the muscle can operate in that, in that kind of sweet spot for, for a lot longer because you know, the, amount of dis, the amount of raw distance has to cover is, is a lot less. All right, any questions on, on this? Yeah. Yeah, so the so the the main ones that are uh, long are um, more kind of in your um, what should I say it's it's, there, it's a lot of it kind of in your in your back and it's kind of for limbs that don't really have a lot of motion and so uh, the ones that do have a lot of motion in your body like like kind of your arms and your legs those have much shorter moment arms but the the ones that don't that the ones that have longer moment arms are the ones where you don't really need to move it as much. And so it's better for to kind of optimize for less muscle force in those, in those cases. And that's mostly kind of in your torso, kind of like for making small adjustments here. And there. Any other questions on, on this? Okay. All right, and so that's everything with muscle dynamics. And so let's go ahead and move on to the next, uh, the next topic, which is uh, human motion kinematics. Okay, so now that you know we've we've kind of given muscles a uh, a much more in depth treatment, and so now we have kind of a stronger understanding of muscles, and we've already talked about walking. You know, we're kind of now ready to start getting into the, um, I would say, kind of the nitty gritty of you know how do we actually analyze and describe motion. Okay, and so um, you know our our first stop here is going to be kinematics. And so kinematics is, is very, very much kind of the same, it kind of serves the same role in biomechanics as it does in just regular mechanics. And that kinematics is just basically the way that we can describe, systematically describe motion. Okay?
because even just even just the topic of, of describing motion is 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 you know a bit complicated. Okay? And so you know probably topics from um, general mechanics in terms of kinematics that you're probably familiar with are things like position, things like velocity, things like acceleration. Okay. And so we're going to be basically learning how to properly describe those things for human motion. Okay? And because of the kind of the interconnected nature of the human body, where we have you know, so many joints and moving parts, uh, we're generally going to be we're generally going to be concerning ourselves with angular kinematics. So angular, um, you know, um, angular displacements, um, angular velocities, and angular accelerations. Okay. Okay. And so things like joint angles, things like joint um, velocity, joint accelerations. Okay? And so we're going to learn, um, you know, first of all, how we measure those things, which is which I think is really cool. And then how do we go from the measurements to actual useful um, numbers and quant and uh, you know quantitative analysis that we can use for for other stuff. Okay. And I think this section is, is really cool because this I I took this from a fairly modern textbook. So this this is a fairly modern approach to the, to this. And it relies on a lot of um, cool technology, um, in particular uh, motion capture. And so this, and so a lot of this chapter, you know, a lot of what we talk about today and Thursday is, you know, we're going to talk about how does motion capture work, and how do we actually go? Well, first of all, you know, what kind of data do you get from motion capture, and then how do you go from motion capture data to actual useful data that you can actually perform simulations on? This technology has kind of advanced quite a bit, and you know, um, ever since kind of the earlier days of, of people analyzing these things, and so you know, with the new technology comes a host of new tools and a lot of new um, skills that come along with it. And so, I'm going to be focusing a lot on that because that's kind of the state of the art in terms of where we kind of are as a field in terms of um, you know studying human motion and, and biomechanics. Okay. okay. Um, and so there is, um, you know, there is kind of a very interesting history in terms of how we got here. And so the, the notes online kind of show a bit of that, but I just kind of want to jump right into, you know, what motion capture is and, you know, how do we actually use it, okay? Okay, uh, so let's talk about motion capture. And so I think generally when people think of motion capture, some people call it mocap, um, you generally think of um, some kind of media. And so either kind of, uh, like computer graphics or video games, which is, you know, mo motion capture is used a lot in, in those cases. Um, but, you know, it, it actually plays a very important role in, in terms of modern study of biomechanics as, as well. And so generally, you know, for, for computer graphics animation, motion capture is used to basically capture, you know, the realistic movements of a human or maybe an animal, and then to use that to pr produce a series of images that could be mimicked by a computer animation, okay? But for biomechanics, we, we generally actually do the opposite. And so motion capture is used to, is used to uh, record a series of images of body positions and orientations. And then we use those to kind of compute or analyze what the underlying bones and uh, muscles are doing um, during that motion.
right? And so that's that's essentially kind of what we are, um, you know, looking for. And so, you know, in biomechanics, we're we're generally most interested in, you know, what's what are the bones doing, what are the muscles doing, and motion capture kind of gives us a way to do that all in real time. And so, you know, you don't you don't have to kind of kind of in the old days of motion capture, you know, we you ha- you kind of had to use a very rigid setup where you had to constrain the motion of a body. Um, you know, to very specific orientations so that you can, you can kind of capture and see what's going on um, either with some still images or with the camera. But with motion capture, you see, we actually get a series of three-dimensional data um, and we can actually analyze a lot of things in, in real time. So it's, it's really kind of opened up a lot in terms of, you know, what we can actually do and what we can actually analyze. Okay. okay and so here are some of the basics. And so you know, you might have seen, you know, images of, you know, maybe Pixar does this stuff or, you know, other, um, you know, other movie companies, okay. So generally speaking, you know, the way mocap works is that you wear this kind of goofy looking suit. And so it's kind of a, um, almost like a onesie. And then all along the suit, you kind of have these, these markers. Okay. I'm gonna use, I'm gonna stand up more. And so along the suit, you know, you're going to have all these uh, little markers. Usually they're spherical in, in nature. Okay. okay. And so what these are, these are kind of small spherical uh, reflective markers. And these markers are placed kind of in a very thoughtful way. So they're not, they're not just random. So they're, they're put on very intentional locations. And so, um, and so we'll talk about kind of, kind of the thought process that goes into, you know, how do you choose which uh, positions? But generally speaking, they're gonna be on locations which are kind of in key locations on your body, which are kind of where your, your, your bony landmarks are. So you'll have uh, markers at the joints, kind of where your elbow, right? if you kind of feel your elbow, which is where kind of the bone sticks out. So generally you want markers in those areas. Um, you know, you want probably want a marker on your kneecap, on your ankle. Um, and so you'll have a set of markers there, but you also need some markers that can be easily spotted on a camera too. And so, um, and so you know, we'll, we'll talk about this in a bit, but as the person kind of wears the mocap suit and they kind of do their, their thing, they kind of dance around, um, all of this is being captured by a bunch of high-speed cameras around. You. And so you need to have markers that are in locations that as the person kind of goes through their motion, you know, they're not going to cover up all the markers. And so they need to be in kind of smart locations where, you know, the, the camera can actually see it for a good amount of time. Okay. So that's generally the idea. And so the idea is that, you know, if you, if you have all these markers and you can track their positions as a function of time, as a person goes through their motion, you can then kind of process that data um, and then kind of put it in a certain way in order to get information of, you know, what are the bones doing? What are the muscles doing? How much force are the muscles outputting? Um, you know, what are the joint angles with respect to time? Okay, so let's talk a bit more about, uh, about marker positioning. And so generally speaking, you know, um, you wanna place the marker such that you can kind of track the entire motion of a body segment, okay? So generally speaking, you know, a body segment is relatively rigid. And so, you know, even though there's gonna be a little bit of motion in terms of, you know, when the muscle contracts, it's gonna shorten, it's gonna kind of, you know, as you go through motion, you know, your fat is going to ripple, things like that. But generally speaking, you know, each segment of your body is considered a kind of a rigid, a rigid segment. Okay.
And then to kind of fully realize that that segment's motion in three dimensions, you need at least three markers on that segment. And those three markers, you know, for just from a mathematical point of view, those three markers can't be in a straight line. And so they have to be, they have to kind of form like a triangle. Okay. So as an example, you know, let's, uh, let's look at your arm. And so you need you need three uh, markers per segment, but you can also share markers at between different segments as well. Um, and so it's it's quite common to actually put a marker at right at a joint, so that two the two adjacent segments can kind of share that same marker. Okay? And so you know usually you know you you'll probably see a marker here right at your elbow, so right where the joint is, and then you know maybe you have a marker here, marker here, okay. And so these are the three markers for the upper arm. And then for the lower arm, you know, maybe you have, maybe you, you use the elbow marker as well. Maybe you have something like that. And the reason you need three um, is that, uh, generally speaking, for each body segment, you need to be able to form a local set of coordinates or a local reference frame. Okay. And we'll talk more about what that what that means and how we actually um, do it. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Any questions on on this so far? All right. So that's the trackers. Um, and so you know you need at least three per segment in order in, in three dimensional space. If you're if you're doing just two D analysis, you only need two. Um, just because there's only two coordinate axes there. Um, but in 3D, we need three. Okay. Let's talk about the cameras for a second. And so, um, you know, in order to actually track these markers, you need a set of cameras. And notice how I said set. And so you can't, you can't do motion capture with just one camera. And the reason for this is that you know the goal the goal of motion capture is to um, determine the three dimensional locations for each of the markers, um, you know, in, in real time. Okay, the limitations of just a single camera is that it can only capture a single two D image.
Okay. And so at the very least, you need two so that you can kind of capture that, that depth coordinate. Um, but having more cameras can help as well because um, there will definitely be times, you know, if you're going through a somewhat complex motion that you may obscure some of the markers. And so having extra cameras around can kind of help with, with that. Okay. But let's do an example here to kind of um, show you kind of how several different cameras kind of reconstruct an image or kind of reconstruct the location of a marker. Okay. <clears throat> and so let's consider a two camera system. And this two camera system is going to track the motion of just a single, a single marker. Okay, and so it may look something like this. And so, you know, let's say that our object is right here. So this is kind of a top-down view of a person. And then their one marker is, let's say that it's, you know, just right here, okay? Okay. And so what's tracking this marker is a couple cameras. And so let's say that we have a camera here on the left. We'll call this camera one. Okay, and it's kind of capturing an image kind of like, like this, okay. So let's say this is camera two. And so camera two is placed kind of perpendicular to that, okay? And, you know, maybe it's capturing an image like this, okay? All right, one extra thing that, uh, that we have here is uh, we need a reference point. And so let's say that we have a reference point. Right here, okay? And so the reference point is, um, you know, important. You'll see if in a second. And so the reference point is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of strategically placed so that it can be seen by both cameras. Um, and uh, it's basically the, the position of the tracking marker will be given based on the distance from the reference point, okay? All right, and so that's, that's, kind, of the, that's kind of the lab setup. And so remember, you're kind of viewing this from, from the top down, okay? Um, Let's say that the camera has kind of took a, a still image of the reference point in the tracker given by the following. And so on the left here, let's say this is camera one. This is camera two. So let's say that, you know, these cameras were positioned in a way where the reference point appears right at the bottom left. And then let's just say, for instance, that the cameras, you know, we've done some filtering and we've, we've removed most of the body. And so all we can see is just the marker. And so let's say that in image one or camera one, we have the marker right here, okay? And then the distance from here to here, let's say is 10 centimeters. Okay. And the distance from the floor up to the marker, we'll say this is 30 centimeters. But in camera two, let's say that the marker appears over here, okay? Or this distance right here is 30 centimeters, okay? And so both, both cameras are seeing the vertical height of the marker off the ground. Okay. And then let's say the distance uh, between the left edge of camera two and the marker is gonna be 50 centimeters from that. 
All right, so based on these images and kind of based on the camera setup right here, um, we can use this data to determine the X, Y, Z position of this, of this marker. And so here, you know, we have a fairly, you know, a fairly simple motion capture setup where we just have a single marker and two cameras. Okay. And so if we make if we make some assumptions here in terms of, um, you know, which planes that this uh, that these cameras are capturing, um, then we can determine the X Y Z positions. Okay. And so for this particular example, we're helped by the fact that camera one and camera two are kind of exactly perpendicular to each other. And so the and so the depth that one camera can't see can be caught exactly by the other camera, okay? Okay. So since... And so, of course, you know, we, we only have the data in terms of camera one, camera two. And so we kind of have to arbitrarily assign, you know, which direction is the X direction, which direction is the Y direction, and which direction is the Z direction. And so we can go ahead and do that uh, now. And so let's say that in camera one, camera one is capturing the X direction horizontally. And so we'll say that cam the X direction is this way on camera one, okay? Going from left to right on camera one. And the vertical distance here, we'll call that the Z direction, okay? That means for camera two, Camera two, which um, you know, which, which captures the same z direction in the same direction. So in camera two, the z direction will point vertically up, just like that. Okay. But the cam, but since camera one has the x direction, you know, horizontally, that means camera two has to capture the y direction. Okay. And so with those uh, with those um, kind of definitions there, we can use the distances from you know, where the point was measured from versus the, the edge of the cameras and the fact that the reference point is in those same location to determine the coordinates. And so the coordinates for this are gonna be 10 centimeters. This, 10, it's, uh, this point here is 10 centimeters horizontally away from the reference point, okay, in the X direction. And then we'll have 50 centimeters because it is a distance, a horizontal distance of 50 centimeters away from the reference point in the y direction. And then in the z direction, the point is 30 centimeters off the ground. Okay. And so even from this kind of relatively simple setup of two cameras, you know, and granted, you know, we had to calibrate it correctly. And so Getting the two cameras to have the reference point in the exact same location is not, um, it, it will take some tweaking to do. Um, but, but generally speaking, if you have relatively well calibrated um, you know, cameras and the, and the uh, motion capture markers can be seen pretty well, then you, know, you can get X, Y, Z positions of the markers uh, just like this. Okay? And generally speaking, this is, this is kind of what you see. And so for each marker that you have on a person's body, you should be able to determine the X, Y, Z positions of them. Um, you know, maybe not throughout the entire motion, but through the majority of the motion.
in reality, you know, we, it's, uh, you know, they use a lot more than just two cameras. You know, it's not uncommon to see over 10 cameras. Um, and then for even more complex motion, you might have even more than that. Uh, I remember, I remember, um, you know, if you, if, and this was revolutionary at the time, now it's not so cool. But, um, when the Matrix first came out as a movie, you know, they, they kind of revolutionized or they kind of had this really cool effect they called bullet time. And so um, cinematically, the way that they produced that was they had, you know, literally hundreds of cameras kind of surrounding an actor as they kind of go through a, a dive or something like that. And what's happening is that as, as, you know, what we perceive as like, you know, a person kind of suspended in air and the camera's going around it, what's actually happening is that the, you're kind of transitioning the view between all the different cameras at the same, at the same time. And so you don't have a single camera that's going super fast around, you know, Neo as he's kind of doing the Superman dive. What you have is actually hundreds of cameras that are capturing the same motion. You're just kind of transitioning between them kind of in a really quick motion. And so motion capture, you're not going to have hundreds of cameras in motion capture most of the time, but you're going to have somewhere in the ballpark of like 10 to 12. That's usually kind of a, um, you know, a good ballpark. And you're going to have them from several different angles too. Because the idea is that, you know, you don't, you don't want to lose track of any of the mocap markers if you, if you've been covered. All right, any questions on, on this? Okay. All right, and so, you know, if you, if you have a, a pretty well calibrated uh, mocap setup, you know, actually the, the accuracy is, is really, really good. And so kind of the tolerance or kind of the, the error that you kind of expect um, in, a, in a situation like this is nothing more than a few millimeters, actually. And so you can capture the position of these markers very, very accurately. Um, and actually, the largest source of error is something that was kind of unexpected. I was surprised to hear this, but kind of the, the biggest source of error in mocap is actually from soft tissue motion. And so if you have a marker, you know, let's say that, you know, you're, you're, you attach the marker to, um, let's say, the, the apex of your bicep muscle. So as you go through your, as you go through the motion, you know, let's say that you're, you're someone that's like totally jacked, right? And so you know, that, that mocap marker is actually going to move along with the muscle, you know, as you kind of flex your arm back and forth. And so that little bit of jiggle, and so, or, you know, let's say that you put the marker on someone's stomach and you, they kind of like slap their stomach and the stomach kind of ripples because of the fat, you know, that's, act, that's actually going to cause more error in the measurements than any of the cameras or any of the, the reflective markers. And so that's actually the biggest source of errors. So, and so generally speaking, you know, for, for a lot of these setups, they try to put the markers on places that aren't going to move that much. And so they try to avoid as much muscle and fat tissue as much as possible. But sometimes you can't help it. Sometimes you have to put a marker in a certain place and you just have to live with, live with some of the errors. Okay. All right. Um, another interesting thing you can do with mocap data is that, you know, of course, here, you know, we're talking about position. Um, but, you know, a lot of times we're interested in velocities as well. Okay. And so the way that we obtain velocity and acceleration um, from position is, you know, exactly the same way that you that you did, uh, you know, in, in basic mechanics, is that you just take a derivative. And so you take uh, you take a derivative of those of those quantities, and you get velocity and acceleration. Okay. The difficult thing about this, um, about taking derivatives, and and this is common, you know, for any kind of uh, um, any kind of data measuring technique, is that when you take derivatives of kind of what I consider kind of real life data like this, um, you kind of put yourself at the mercy of, of noise, okay? And so this is this is this is kind of an issue whenever you take any kind of, of, of measurement, right? Um, and so even you know you you'd be surprised too. And so even if you were to measure you know the speed of your car, right? Um, and so 
you know, it's, it's, not, it's not shown in your car just because, you know, they, they, they kind of process the data, but your speed kind of fluctuates quite a bit. So if you were to kind of measure the raw speed, you know, you would, might see a lot of fluctuations. And so if you're to track, you know, let's say the X position of a marker, you know, it may look something like this. And so, you know, when you have a noisy curve like this, you can, you can obviously see kind of the underlying kind of curve down there. So it kind of looks like a sine wave, but because of all these kind of small peaks and valleys here due to the noise, when you take a derivative, you know, it may not be that accurate. And so generally what's done is that before you take any kind of derivative of, of this is that you have to kind of filter and smooth the signal. So I thought I thought I would mention that just because you know that's that's kind of a, a real life kind of practical issue. Okay. All right. Any questions on on this so far? Okay. All right. And so that's that's kind of motion capture in a nutshell. So it's and so this this area is actually really really exciting. And so there's there's kind of a lot of rapid improvements recently, um, and a lot of things that you can do even with just super cheap parts. And so. Um, you know, um, and there's a lot of things that you can do even without um, reflective markers too. And so there's, there's even programs that you can download just on your own personal computer that you can use to track, you know, your own, your own body. And so um, this is kind of getting into my own hobbies, but there's, there's, there's um, a thing called VTubing that's happening a lot recently where you can actually download like a, like a computer avatar for yourself. And then, you know, just using your webcam that, that it can actually track your movements and eye movements, which is, which is crazy, I think, you know, the fact that we've kind of come this far and you can actually, you know, use a lot of that stuff, you know, just on your own personal computer. And the fact that they're kind of putting it out there for everyone to use is, is, is amazing. So it's, it's a really exciting time. And, uh, um, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of really cool stuff happening. Am I a VTuber? No. Um, sometimes I wish. I think that'd be more fun than, than working at Cal State Fullerton. But, <laughs> but no, I... I I like this job. I like this job. I hate my employer, but I like I like this job too much to uh, to give it up. Okay. All right. So let's uh, so let, now let's talk about. So we have about ten more minutes left in class, um, and so you know, of course, you know, we, we can't cover all of it. Let's go ahead and start our next discussion of you know how do we go from this kind of motion capture data to actually something we can actually use for analysis. Okay? And so that's going to be called un. We'll start with kind of unconstrained inverse kinematics. Okay. And so kind of from here on out, we'll, we'll assume that, you know, we have mocap data um, available to us. And now we're kind of in the process of, you know, we have the data, we have kind of the X, Y, Z positions of the tracking markers. And how do we go from these, from this data to actual, you know, biomechanical kinematics, okay? And so this is gonna be how, And so by biomechanical kinematics, what I mean by that are things like joint angles, body angles, joint um, angular velocities, angular accelerations, and things like that.
because those are things that, um, you know, and we'll, and we'll do this next week when we go over dynamics, you know, kind of the input for dynamics are things like knowledge of the angular positions, angular velocities, angular accelerations. And so we need all that data in order to do the dynamics analysis. Okay. Okay, but let's talk about kind of how we get there. All right, and so the first thing, um, you know, we're, we're gonna focus our, our, our analysis here on kind of segment by segment analysis. And so just like I mentioned earlier, we're going to assume each body segment or segment of the body is gonna be a single rigid um, entity. And the rigid assumption is, is key here. And so we're gonna assume that the body segment is not going to deform or it's not going to stretch or it's not gonna compress appreciably. Okay? So it's gonna stay kind of roughly, roughly the same shape and, and size. And so, of course, the body segments are going to be separated by the joints. Okay? And so, the elbow joint, wrist joint, you know, those are the things that are going to separate the joints or separate the segments. And they're going to determine how the segments can move past each other. Okay. And so, when we talk about, um, you know, biomechanical kinematics, you know, we talk about angular positions, angular um, velocities. That's kind of the angle between one segment relative to each other at the joints. Okay. And so for instance, you know, if we have, you know, we have the elbow joint. And so let's say this is the upper arm, this is the lower arm. Okay. okay. The elbow joint angle is simply just the angle that forms in between these two, these two joints. Okay. So I'll call it theta E for elbow joint. And so kind of the goal for inverse kinematics is to determine, you know, what are all of these angles between um, the different segments? And the way we do that is that we're going to use, we're basically going to use the positional uh, mocap markers to establish a local set of coordinates for each body set. And so, you know, let me go ahead and use the arm again. So let's say this is the arm. So this is the upper arm. Or arm. This is the hand. Okay. And so what we want to do is basically we're going to use the positional markers to establish coordinate systems, and I'm, I'm just using 2D here, but imagine that these coordinate systems also extend in 3D as well, okay? 
So let's say that for the upper arm, we have a coordinate system we'll call x1, y1. For the lower arm, we have another coordinate system, x2, y2, okay? And so these are gonna be fixed to the arm or to each segment, I guess. And then for the hand, we have another coordinate system, x3, y3. And so the idea is that, you know, the, the orientation and position of these coordinate systems are gonna be fixed. And so as the body kind of goes through motion, what we can do is we can, we can kind of measure the relative change between the coordinate axes of two adjacent segments to determine the angles, okay? And so let's say that you know you you're going to curl your elbow up. So let's say that you have you know something like this now. And so relative to the top image, you kind of curled your your elbow. Okay, so you kind of reduce that angle. But as you did that, the coordinate systems kind of also moved as well. Okay, and so x one y one actually still stay kind of relatively the same. But X2 and Y2, um, you know, because your, L, because your lower arm now is kind of oriented upwards, then, you know, the coordinate axes for that segment are also going to orient themselves upward as well. Okay, same thing for the wrist. Okay. And so to measure, and so to measure the joint angle, what we can do Measure the joint angles, we can basically compare the x axis for one for one segment and the x axis for another segment. Just as an example, you can use the y axis as well, and we can just measure kind of the angle in between those. Okay. And then the angle that they form, or maybe some, some function of that angle, maybe 90 degrees minus that angle, that's going to be the joint angle that we, that we decide. Okay. All right, so that's, so that's kind of the, that, that's the general idea. And, and I want to make sure, I wanted to make sure I cover this today, because once we get to the actual calculations on Thursday, it's, it's going to be a lot of linear algebra, there's, there's a lot of details associated with this. And so I tried my best to kind of, you know, to try to, you know, talk about those, to avoid getting into the weeds too much, but with this one, there, there, it's just, you kind of have to do it. And so you kind of have to do just a lot of the calculations uh, for it. And so on Thursday, what I'm gonna do is, you know, we're, we're gonna kind of get, really get into the weeds of this in, in terms of, you know, how do you actually compute these things? Um, you know, what are we looking for? How do we form the matrices? What do the matrices represent? And then actually kind of really slog through the calculation and, and it and it kind of will be a slog. And so, you know, I kind of want to warn you guys ahead of time that it's 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 not going to be pretty, but I want to make sure I, I cover this today just to kind of give you an idea of what we're looking for before we jump too much into the math. Okay. Um, I mean, right. we haven't got there yet, but just a question: what's the usual convention for defining the angles to adjacent x-axis? Is it like counterclockwise or clockwise usually? Usually it's uh usually it's clock counterclockwise. Okay, so just regular, I guess, to like what we usually do. Exactly, yeah. But then once you kind of get into the third dimension, that's that's when things kind of get a little bit complicated because then instead of just one angle, you have three. Um, and then extracting that from kind of a, what we call a transformation matrix is, um, yeah, it's it's a little bit complicated. So yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get there on, on Thursday. Yeah. Sweet. All right, uh, any final questions on, on this? Okay, all right, so we'll pick this up on Thursday. Um, you know, Thursday will be fun. And so I think what I'll do on Thursday, because I, I have your next homework prep, and then this is kind of a big portion of that. I might actually kind of partially work through one of the homework problems, just, just so that you have an idea, because you kind of have to see kind of a calculation go through. And I don't have a full calculation like that in the notes, which I, I realized was kind of a big mistake. 
And so I think what I'll do on Thursday is I'll, I'll introduce a theory to you and then we'll kind of work through part of a homework problem just so you can kind of see what's what's going on. All right, so thank you guys for coming today. Um, you know, and and um, you know, thank you guys for listening to Nathan at the beginning today. If you have any questions on the homework or anything, you know, you can reach out to me as always. Uh, hope you guys enjoy the rest of your day, and I will see you on Thursday. I thought she was going to be back today. I haven't heard her back. I've, I've actually sent her a couple emails, but she hasn't gotten back. No worries. Yeah. Yeah. I think she I think she was on vacation end of last week and beginning this week. I think she's catching up on that. But yeah, as soon as like, you're back from the so I'm in setting up to me. I can tell them that I can tell them. Um, I was applying uh, virtually everywhere, and a couple of the stuff I was in my uh, biomedical companies. Okay. But does the word Massimo ring a bell? Or does the name Massimo ring a bell? It does. I actually think I I think I have a friend that works there. Or he worked there at some point. Gotcha. Um, yes, I don't know too much about them, but they are they are. But my friends seem pretty happy when he's working. Uh, yeah, they're a certified great place to work and all that. And yeah. then I have a friend who works there too, so that's how I heard about the company as nice. well. Nice. Quite a fun. Uh, and they actually reached out and interested in me. Nice. Uh, right. that's awesome. Yeah, so I'm, uh, it's for a process engineering position, which okay. is uh, great because I'm already getting a process engineer for uh -huh. uh, another rap and phone company at Alex Accenture. Yeah. Um, but if I'm being honest, I'm a little scared because it's going to be a half technical, half uh, half like behavioral question. I see. Like, so I'm gonna do you have any pointers or do you think maybe um, I can kind of go over how I prepped up with you on Thursday or through office hours? And maybe... Yeah, yeah, we can, we can definitely talk about it in office hours, but I, I would say um, for the technical questions, I think what they're mostly interested, because like it's it's kind of a crapshoot, honestly, like in terms of, you know, whether you kind of know what they're gonna ask or not, because it's, it's technical, right? And right. so if you learn it in a class, you can answer it, of course, but if you didn't, then you can't. And so I think what they're more interested in is how you kind of approach those problems. Gotcha. And so when they ask you a technical question, what they're more interested in is kind of how you kind of work your way through it. And so I think that's that's kind of because everyone's kind of nervous about the technical question. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the advice I give people is that you know if they can see that you know that your logic is sound and you may not know exactly what they're looking for, but you can kind of try to work your way through it, mm -hmm. that is something that's important because. You know, when you get, whenever you start a new job, there's always a lot of stuff that you're going to learn anyway about the company, about how to do things, the technical details. And so you're going to have to demonstrate that kind of learning process too. So gotcha. if you can try to demonstrate that kind of in a, in a short time frame in the technical questions, I think that's more important than just kind of blurting out whatever answer that they're looking for. Too. Gotcha. So, um, and then the behavioral stuff, you know, there's, there's tons of practice you can do with that right. too. Um, you know, I would, I would practice that with your friends actually too. And so what helped me the most when I was applying for jobs is getting mock interviews from my friends. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, maybe, you know, probably your friends won't know what type of questions they can ask, but they can help you with, you know, like with the question, like, tell me about yourself or, you know, what's your greatest strength? Your greatest strength. Those questions always get asked. And so in some form or the other. And so if you practice those, then you're going to kind of know. Mm -hmm. cool. Um, do you think I can borrow you from one of those? I've asked a couple of friends and it's sure. like this is really busy for everybody. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can definitely come by office. I know at least a couple of people want to, Come by and ask questions tomorrow. Um, um, what time tomorrow? Because well, I think I'd be most available after my combustor class. I was planning on working a bit more on my, uh, on my interview prep afterwards. So, would uh, you be open after 5 30? Yes, I can do 5 30. Um, yeah, yeah, you should just um, let's go ahead and use. So, I'll be working from home tomorrow. That's and so, let's uh, so let's use the Zoom link for Wednesday off. So, I'll be on I'll be on 5 30. And if not, just shoot me an email. Just doing that for sure. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jerry, uh, any final questions before I close this up? Oh, sure. What's up? Uh, no, I can't. Uh, I can bear. I can bear. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. What's up? I can hear you. Okay. Cool. Um. Just a quick question. Um, on the first problem for the homework, oh, sorry, for the second problem, the homework you gave us the fro, fro, fruit, fruit equation. I don't know how to pronounce yeah, it. Fruit. Yeah, fruit number. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So you're giving us. We were given the step length of the person. Um, just to clarify, that is not the length of his leg, correct? No, it's not. Um, 
Yeah, so the step length is something different. So the, the length of the leg that goes in the fruit number, that's, I think that's given to you in the, in the problem, it should be. Um, I, I did, there was a typo on that initially. And so I did, uh, um, I gave you the wrong equation for the fruit number. So make sure you kind of download the most updated version of that, from that assignment. Gotcha. So we can find the length of his leg using their step length, I'm assuming? I mean, let me take a look at it again real quick. Um, actually, no, I have it here on Dropbox. Yeah, because that's the only problem that's stumping me right now. Just that one. Let's see. Yeah, so we're given two two things for part A. We're given his we're given his step length and how many steps he takes per minute. Yeah. Uh, so, you, so you don't you don't need the uh, you don't need the the leg length for part A because part A you just I just want you to compute the uh, the walking speed. So oh. the, walking, the walking speed is just the product of the the, the length and the and the frequency. <laughs> okay, I was only, it's only part B where you need the leg length. So the part B that's that's given to you as um, basically ninety centimeters. Yeah. Okay, I was thinking way too hard about that. Okay, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Uh -huh. All right, thank you. Bye bye. Yep. Bye.